I'm going to talk about um, my experiences of doing multidisciplinary research, um, particularly on projects that look at issues around big data or involve big data. And that's partly because I think there's been a lot of interesting conversations about what big data can offer social science. But I think as qualitative researchers, it's sometimes quite challenging in those contexts to kind of really demonstrate your value and kind of um, make sure that there's a true kind of collaboration that can take place. So just to say a little bit about kind of my background and where I'm from, I'm a, a social scientist. I've got degrees in communications, in psychology, in sociology and education. So I'm from a multidisciplinary background um, um, myself. I describe myself as a mixed method researcher. I work um, uh, the majority of the time at the Oxford Internet Institute, which is a uh, multidisciplinary department within the social sciences division at Oxford. And we look at the social implications of the internet. And so I might work on a whole range of different projects with people from a range of different disciplinary backgrounds, from engineering, physics, uh, politics, uh, history, all kinds of disciplines. And we come together around particular problems. And in the last few years, a lot of those projects have involved some aspect of, of big data research in some respect. So I'm not going to talk a lot about you know, the excitement around big data or how to define it because I think there's already been a lot of work that, that's done that. But I do think it offers us a really exciting opportunity as social scientists. Um, the ways that we can now collect all sorts of data as people go about their digitally mediated lives from um, their where they're going in terms of and, and their movements um, uh, tracked through their mobile phones to their interactions through social media and the possibilities of kind of taking that data and then connecting it to other kinds of data um, for example the data that governments collect about us or that um, commercial companies collect about us in terms of loyalty cards and shopping uh, habits and purchases and so on can be potentially really exciting and very valuable um, so there's lots of positives there I think it's the way that we can get this kind of really um, precise, um, real-time data um, about people's behaviours and practices. Um, but we can only measure certain things right, as we all well know. So it's not very good at thinking about experience or um, understanding. Um, there's certain kinds of questions that can be answered with this kind of research, but not all. Um, and it certainly prioritises certain actors, those who are much more technically um, engaged and those who are kind of louder online. And so sometimes it's quite hard for qualitative researchers to really kind of get into that space and, and be part of it, I think. So for me, when I talk about big data <coughs> as a kind of shorthand for all these kinds of large scale data sets that we can potentially use, um, I see it as a complement to other forms of data and other approaches within social science. I don't see it as a kind of end of social science research as some people might claim. But I really do see that multidisciplinary work and mixed method research around, uh, um, as we've already heard, around big social questions are becoming increasingly commonplace and are really important to do. And I see qualitative work as absolutely key within that kind of wider setting. And I think what we're risking at the moment with the kind of debates around big data is that we've had these very unhelpful silos between quant and qual for many decades. I mean, we kind of try and overcome them all the time. And now we have small versus big. It's new words, but the same problems. And I think that can be a real, real problem that we need to think about ways, creative ways of addressing. So I just, in this short talk, really want to talk about kind of nine, I don't know if they're tips exactly, but um, proposals really for multidisciplinary working, just from my own experiences, things that I think have worked well or things that have struck me as important um, when trying to think about um, uh, our role as qualitative researchers within these wider, more complex projects. Um, and so the first one um, is about thinking about people's differences in perspectives, as we've already talked about, and, and, and where people are coming from. So um, about a year ago, I did a project where I spoke to a range of um, data scientists um, uh, at the OII and elsewhere about their um, experiences of working with social scientists and how they felt about it. So to try and get it from their perspective as well as from my own. And as this quote kind of demonstrates, it's really important to kind of see where people are coming from. So this data scientist gets upset often because when they produce their beautiful models based on all this data, then um, more qualitative researchers or other researchers from sociology might come along and say, well, I'm not sure that model really works or that data doesn't make any sense. And for them, you're critiquing 
their practice, you're critiquing, you're suggesting that they haven't run the model correctly or they've miscalculated um, the technology behind it. They don't kind of see it that we sort of see data as constructed, as shaped, as, as ever changing and something to be discussed in those kind of ways. So really thinking about how people talk about and think about these questions is really important within um, a multidisciplinary group. The second thing I think is really interesting is about the ethical issues that come up when you do multidisciplinary work. I think it's really striking how our disciplinary backgrounds really shape our views about ethics. And um, with big data and the potential to link all sorts of different kinds of data together about individuals, these kinds of questions are only going to get more complicated. Um, and while we may be able to get the kind of institutional approval that we all have to get for our ethics projects, that's very different to our personal codes of practice. And so within a team, you might have very different perceptions about ethical practice, um, even if you've kind of got the OK from the institution. And you kind of have to navigate that throughout the projects. This is really interesting, I think, when you might work with a commercial partner. And this was kind of seen um, in some Facebook studies a, a couple of years ago, where um, commercial companies will always operate within the kind of legal frameworks. But um, us as academic researchers may often want to work within ethical codes that are kind of hi a higher bar, if you like. And so the tensions there, when you're working with different actors, can be um, important to navigate. The third aspect, um, I think, and it's so um, such a key part of um, the whole conversations around big data and thinking about them um, in terms of um, what's possible in social science research, is how we understand, think about uh, the construction of data. And of course, as qualitative researchers, we're really well positioned to think about that. Um, and this quote from a data scientist really kind of shows how they appreciate that. You know, data people are careless with words. They count how many times two people have called each other during a six-month period and call this quantity friendship strength. They count how many times people have mentioned Obama in their tweets and they call it a political index of the user. And they go on to say, what I like about social scientists is they're very careful about words, terms and definitions. And I think as qualitative researchers, we really think about how our data is constructed, how it's shaped, how the ways that we've collected that data is shaping our understanding of it. And it also makes us particularly careful about what that data really represents and how we should use it. And in a multidisciplinary project, it can be really helpful to have those really careful conversations about what it really means, rather than kind of just taking um, a kind of label for granted, I suppose. The fourth one is, is somehow working out ways to work together that, that facilitates a really creative approach. So I think it's really important in multidisciplinary projects that are successful, not for each person to have a particular um, method or question or technique that they're going to go and answer and everybody just kind of comes together at the end and we, we write a report. It's very much about trying to share ideas and, and perspectives all the way through and think really creatively about how we can use this data. So although there's been a lot of excitement about big data and how you analyse it, it's quite hard if you've ever tried it to really think about good questions to ask, um, to run different models. And there's actually an awful lot of similarity between um, the kind of uh, data mining techniques that data scientists use and grounded theory. There's actually much more commonality than I think um, many people um, think about. And so. I love um, Kathy Marsh's work, even though it's you know, from the 1980s, who talked about what, data, what social scientists need in terms of um, using data. And she talked about the kind of need for analytic flair, this ability to kind of think creatively about how to analyse data, alongside, and very importantly, social sensitivity. So this idea that you kind of are understanding of the world and what that data represents and the people that you are trying to talk about. And so I think that's still really relevant today. One of the things I often see in kind of projects that have um, big data aspects and, and qualitative aspects as well is the real challenges of sampling. So, for example, um, we worked on a project a couple of years ago around massive open online courses, and the data scientists had uh, 90,000 people and digital trace data from six weeks of everything that they did online, whereas I had 30 interviews. Okay, <laughs> and. Um, how do you make those data seem just as important as each other when everybody loves numbers so much, right? How do you really kind of deal with that? And so you have to come up with creative ways of really thinking about how you can sort of level that playing field. So every 
um, part of the research is counted equally. And this, this diagram, don't worry about it too much, but it's just to illustrate the difficulties of that problem. So this is um, uh, a chart that just illustrates um, how uh, closely connected different subforums on that particular online course were. Um, uh, the green line is, is the most kind of cohesive group and the ones um, uh, towards the other side uh, just kind of fall away very easily and there's no sort of sense of community. And the numbers are where we plotted our interviewees. Um, they're the people um, at certain points um, in these graphs. But it doesn't really tell us very much. But then what we realised what we could do is we could um, uh, actually use the qualitative insights to think about how we could use the quantitative data to develop a typology of how people were engaging with the forums. And then we came up with kind of four ways that people were interacting with the forums. And then we could link our qualitative data to those four kinds of types. And then suddenly the data kind of was on a level playing field. And there are other ways of doing this. So for example, using social network analysis on large scale data to work out who in, in the group might be interesting to interview. So you could start to purposively sample through using more quantitative techniques. So there are ways of dealing with that, which I think um, are quite challenging, but are really important. I also think um, uh, as qualitative researchers, it's easy sometimes to sort of think, oh, well, we don't need to know about the data analysis, you know, the quantitative data analysis aspects or how the data is collected or, or captured. But I think all of us now need some kind of understanding of how people retrieve these kind of large scale data sets, um, how they're coded, how they're manipulated and the kinds of analysis that are possible. I'm not saying we all have to be experts, but I think we have to know enough to be able to have conversations about it and to kind of know whether it's sensible or not to use certain kinds of approaches. And um, Goldra Mesa talked really nicely about that, if you're interested. I also think it sort of carries on into the anal analysis process. So really understanding um, how the algorithms are being built and how they're being applied to the data sets and what that really means um, for particular ways of thinking about the data. Um, and there's this really nice example here from another project where basically the sociologist and data scientist sat together um, and the data scientist co you know, was coding and analysing the data and the sociologist was looking at the choices he was making <coughs> while doing that. And so those kinds of truly um, kind of engaged ways of talking about analysis and data um, can be very helpful, I think. I also think that um, a really important role for qualitative research is to really um, communicate the findings from these stories to lots of different audiences, the, the research kind of findings. Um, I, I think you can be a very good data scientist but not necessarily write beautifully, but as a qualitative researcher you need to always write really well, that's part of the kind of analyst analytical process for me is to be able to write um, uh, about your participants and about the experiences. So we're very well placed to write about um, these different research findings for different audiences. What we often do in the teams that I work in is that each of us um, takes a lead on one particular paper that speaks to our particular discipline um, and we'll do the first draft of that particular paper and then everybody else will make comments and, and help make changes and so on and everybody's on everyone's paper but we all have one paper as a lead author and that works really nicely so that we all talk back to a whole range of different disciplines but you can't really do that unless you understand the entire research process and the entire analytical process even if you choose to focus on one particular, particular element of it. And then finally um, I would like to say that I have a very, um, I'm very lucky in my uh, ways of working in terms of multidisciplinary research. I work in a department that is multidisciplinary. That means that I know the people that I work with before we start a project, which is hugely um, uh, valuable and makes a lot of difference. Um, and but even then, we still have to kind of work at it. So things, for example, like agreeing on a common vocabulary is really hard to do. I worked on one project where we really thought that we were agreeing on everything, like it was really good and, and we were really excited about it. And we were recording our conversations to see how well you know, the discussions were going. And after a few weeks, we started to play those transcripts and look at them. And we started to realize that we were talking at totally cross purposes, like we weren't agreeing on anything. Um, so while it was all very good natured, it wasn't in, in very productive. Another thing that gets it, that's really important to do is to be able to explain concepts well. Um, so 
whether it's um, a theoretical concept or an analytical approach, everybody has to be able to explain to other people who are non-experts in the team what they're doing and why. Um, and, and to really sort of um, be able to do that again and again and answer any kind of random question that might emerge so that we all have an understanding of what everybody's doing and nobody kind of gets lost in the process. And what we really try and do is work collaboratively and not just cooperatively. And what I mean by that is we don't just divide up the project and everybody goes off and does their thing and you know works on their bits that they're expert in. We meet every week and we kind of talk about the findings that we have and the ideas that we have and we suggest things to each other and we go again for another week and we come back together again. And so it's incredibly um, messy it's not like we have some neat questions at the beginning that we can just answer. We're constantly kind of um, revising and changing what we're doing. So it's, it's very um, uh, kind of bottom up, if you like. But it, it's, it's the way to create something that's um, truly valuable for everybody to come together rather than just have, you know, four separate projects, essentially, or six separate projects. It's, it's truly trying to get to something a bit more meaningful together. Um, and the last sorts of points I wanted to make really were just again about kind of the challenges. So I think um, big data offers really exciting op options for social science as well as challenges. And it's a good kind of way of looking at some of these um, difficulties of doing multidisciplinary work and how we can kind of cross these methodological and disciplinary boundaries and come together and create something kind of bigger than the sum of its parts, I suppose. Um, I hope I've sort of shown that I really see that qualitative expertise is central in all of this. It's not like an add-on that you do at the end or just something to kind of figure out what the, you know, what one of the trends meant. It has to be kind of part of it right from the beginning. But I think as well as the funding point, which is um, absolutely key, I also think that um, we need to really think about the structures in higher education to support this kind of work. Um, because it's, it's easy for me to sort of say, well, multidisciplinary teams kind of work if you work within a, a department that enables these sorts of things, but it is challenging. So, for example, when we all write one paper as lead author, but we're on four papers, how do you deal with that in the ref if you're an early career researcher? You've only got one paper that's really in your discipline and three that don't count in the same kind of way. So we really have to think about how we change structures and practices of working to support those kinds of things.